This episode of the Police One Podcast is sponsored by Officer Store. Learn more about getting the gear you need at prices you can afford by visiting officerstore.com. Hey there, you are listening to Policing Matters on PoliceOne.com. I am your host, Jim Dudley. Hey, welcome back, and I hope you're catching us on YouTube as well. Well, the likelihood of coming across a mass murderer is not something we'd expect during a normal course of duty. Would we recognize it? The encounter may not be what we see in the movies or read about in books. Um, Truth, the encounter may be placing a ticket on the windshield of a parked vehicle while the murderer or the killer is at work. Maybe it's a traffic stop along a highway, or maybe it is pulling over the car of a bomber who just left the scene of the crime. Or maybe it's during a response to a particular call for service that may seem like a domestic disturbance. Well, all of those things, of course, happened. They're real. Uh, we could talk about uh, Son of Sam, and we could talk about uh, the Unabomber. We could talk about uh, McVeigh and the the bombing in Oklahoma. And today we're going to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer, that last domestic disturbance call. Well, since leaving journalism, she's worked in a variety of communication roles with law enforcement, including the Milwaukee Police Department, the Wisconsin Department of Justice. She served on too many committees, boards, and contributed to articles and publications for law enforcement for us to talk about right now. So you can check out her full bio on our show notes page. Well, I've got a great guest here. Welcome to Policing Matters, Anne E. Schwartz. Thank you, Jim. I'm so glad to be here with you. And any chance we have to talk about good police work and bringing, bringing down a serial killer, I'm glad to be part of that. Yeah, so you wrote the book in 1991, The Man Who Could Not Kill Enough, and the 2021 update, Monster, The True Story of the Jeffrey Dahmer Murders. Please start from the beginning. I'm, guess, it's, I'm guessing that it was a slow news day and you get this call that will pretty much change your life. As cops know, and journalists, you never make the comment out loud, it's a slow day. <laughs> because that's when the that's when something happens. I was a, a young police reporter. I was covering night cops, which is the unenviable shift of four to midnight, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. Um, so you just pretty much say, I'm not going to have a life. I'm just going to do this. But this was actually during the week. Uh, I got a call from one of my sources saying, Annie, you've got to get out here to 25th and Kilbourne. There's a guy, it looks like he's been saving body, body parts in, in his apartment. Uh, you know, we just, we just, we we're not really sure what we're looking at here. And that was that. He's got to get out here. So, you know, I, I'm i used to you guys, Jim. I know that sometimes people like to have a little fun with you. Someone calls you and tells you something that's not true. But the tenor of this officer's voice was such that I thought, you know, I'm I'm going to go. I'm going to just going to see what happens. So I went out to 25th and Kilbourne and I was the first reporter on the scene. I was the only reporter on the scene for probably about an hour. Uh, they were still the the all oh, the crime scene tape wasn't up yet. Dahmer had already been removed from the scene and was gone. But what I found is the uh, neighbors who were, they evacuated the building because this was going to be a hazardous materials uh, incident. Actually, it was a hazmat response because of all the chemicals that Dahmer had kept in that apartment. Um, and the, the police just didn't know what, what else to do. So uh, I'm talking to the neighbors and the neighbors are, are very unlike you usually see at a crime scene. People are always talking and, you know, hey, talk to me. And the people are talking. It was, it was so quiet. It was the eeriest quiet I have I have ever heard for as many people that were standing outside. Nobody was speaking. And one woman, Pamela Bass, who turns out to be Jeffrey Dahmer's across the hall neighbor, said to me, uh, she said, they're saying that they found body parts in, in that apartment that, you know, that people might have been killed in there. I talked to her for just a little bit 
and then I walked into the into the apartment building. Now remember, it's early, but Jim also remember this: that when I'm walking up to that apartment, the police aren't treating aren't really behaving like it's a normal crime scene because it's not. It's nothing most of these veteran officers have ever seen before. So I'm standing at the doorway of the apartment and all the detectives are in, uh, the, there were uh, two officers and a couple of detectives. It was still very early. And what they had found is they had found Polaroids that Jeffrey Dahmer had taken of his victims in various stages of dismemberment in a dresser drawer. So really nobody's looking to say, hey, Annie Schwartz, what's she doing standing there? I mean, nobody had any idea I was I was there and I did not walk into the apartment. I was at the the, uh, the threshold of the apartment. I looked kind of around a little bit just to see, you know, gee, what does this look like? But remember, I'm not standing there thinking, oh my gosh, this is history. This is a serial killer. Uh, and, and the police weren't either. They were just trying to grasp what they were looking at. And that is the, that really is the, is the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. It's all about people saying, no, it couldn't be, or what really is this? Um, the, that was the, the, the beginning of my telling the story and following the Jeffrey Dahmer case, even as we sit here, you know, 32 years later, 33 years later, I keep forgetting how long it is. The second book, Monster, came out in 2021, which was the 30 year anniversary, if you will, of the case. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to go back in time and re-interview some of those police officers that were there that night, some of those detectives, and say, 30 years later, what does is, what is life look like? Do you ever think about it? Do you ever think of the case? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the police end up at that apartment that night because the man who would have been Dahmer's 18th victim escaped. Tracy Edwards, he's running down the street and he's got a handcuff on. He had escaped Dahmer's apartment because he said it was just getting very freaky. So he's running down the street and he sees two police officers, Bob Routh and, and um, uh, Rolf Mueller. Uh, Rolf Mueller, we just uh, lost, I, I think about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, his wife, by the way, uh, in, the, in the second book told me she said he was never the same. He suffered from horrible, horrible trauma, night tremors, PTSD. But 1991, Jim, you remember policing in 1991. Suck it up. Suck it up. Get back out there. So he suffered till the till the day he died. But he and his partner that night in 1991 uh, stopped and talked to Tracy Edwards. And they were joking. They said, hey, which one of us did you escape from? Because he's running with a, with a handcuff. Just one. And Tracy Edwards starts to, starts to tell them kind of this fantastical story, but all Tracy Edwards wants is to get out of the handcuffs. He doesn't really want to report this because he just went back to a guy's apartment to have sex with him for money. It's not like he wants to tell the police, hey, and it got weird. You know, he just wants to get out of there. But the more he talked to these officers, they were like, well, let's, let's just, you know, see what's going on here. Thank God. Thank God for those two officers. So they walk back to Dahmer's apartment with Tracy Edwards. Uh, they knock on the door and Dahmer looks and he sees two officers outside his door. Dahmer, remember, has a history of fooling the police. He's a master manipulator. And you and I, I'm sure, will talk, talk about how he fooled the police uh, when one of his victims was, uh, uh, was, in, his, uh, was in his clutches and he was able to tell the police a story that they believe. But on this night, they they see the he sees the officers standing there. He's gonna he's gonna talk to them because why be afraid of that? He's manipulated them before. And then he sees Tracy Edwards in the back when he opens up the door, tries to fight, and then finally, like many serial killers do, he just gives in because he realizes it's over. He realizes he's caught, mm. and. From that night on, I mean, it's been 33 years of telling that story. Uh, it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. People don't, I mean, have you ever heard in your in your life in policing, which I bet you have, oh, that doesn't happen here. That kind of thing can't happen here. 
And that's yes. exactly what Milwaukee felt that night. Right. So when you're talking uh, to this group of neighbors and they're all saying, oh, he's such a nice guy, he's a quiet neighbor, all these things that we've always heard after these mm -hmm. kinds of incidents, when did it start to sink in to you that this is more than that murder, the one one time murder that that you realize the enormity of the situation? Well, one of my sources told me that there was a blue barrel inside the apartment that appeared to contain body parts. That's not a normal homicide. And and they also they were finding skulls in his apartment, not just one, not a body, but skulls. They also were finding painted skulls because Dahmer always thought it was a possibility that somebody might come in or somebody might see that he was saving the skulls of his victims, trophies, as they do save. Um, and so he painted a couple of them gray so they would look like plastic models. And he could say, oh, those aren't those aren't real. But they were. They were real people. And the uh, the I'm, I'm looking up on my on my office uh, wall and it I have the headline up there that says body parts litter apartment. And that was the very first headline. That was the very first news that Milwaukee had a serial killer. Hmm. And so you, you you describe when you get there, you, you talk to the people outside, you get to the threshold, you could see inside the apartment. What was it, your access like? You, you had made relationships with local PD before that. What kind of access did you get to this story? I had a lot of access to the story because... Do you know a cop that doesn't like to tell a story, Jim? <laughs> I love to tell a story. And so, and this was so incredible. This was so unbelievable. And I am, I am uh, uh, proud of the fact that they always spoke to me. I mean, I did a lot of things as a cub reporter that reporters just don't do anymore. I went on ride alongs on my own time uh, because on when I was, when I was reporting for the paper on that cop shift, I had to sit in a room and listen to scanners and then go out to anything that sounded like it was interesting. So I, I had built up trust. I had done many stories before the Jeffrey Dahmer case where the officers, people had given me information and they weren't burned. Uh, that world, I don't know that that world exists anymore. Maybe it does. Maybe there are reporters that, that people talk to. When I counsel law enforcement about how to speak to media, I just say, don't. Um, and then I, I lay out a, uh, you know, a set of talking points and say, be very careful. These, these, these officers that, that talked to me did this at great peril to their own jobs because there was an investigation into who gave me all the information that I had in this case. Um, so I'm talking to the neighbors when I first arrived and I got to believe those were the last real true interviews that those people gave because the versions of this story that have come out after this thing becomes a, you can tell it's going to go global by the first 24 hours. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and that is when the police start using the phrase serial killer. So I know that we are, we're getting to, uh, we're we're in some uncharted territory here. Yeah, for sure. And you you talk about uh, what happened next over the unveiling over time. You just gave two really good uh, inside views, and one is that cops like to talk. And we've talked about it on the show. Uh, you know, we have this sense of humor sometimes, a uh, macabre sense of humor at these kinds of scenes. Uh, and that's to deal with the trauma, the vicarious trauma, the trauma that cops see. As a reporter, you're witnessing vicarious trauma as well. Did you ever commiserate with cops? Did you ever talk about the impact of this? You, you talked about the one officer who had, you know, the the PTSD for a year. I mean, till the day he, he passed uh, about this one particular incident. How about you? I uh, perhaps I have a cold heart, Jim. We just don't know. Um, but I have uh, I am I'm 63 now and I've been, you know, I was a I started as a reporter when I was, you know, in my 20s. So it's a lot of years of seeing a lot of scenes and seeing a lot of cops. I'll tell you what's different. You talked about how, you know, we all kind of have that very dark weirdo sense of humor. 
I've seen that at every crime scene except this one. I that this one and then anything involving a child whenever there's a child death. But I have never seen a, a time when you know there wasn't like a little jocularity. I think I think that I know that the detectives and police officers that responded to this incident were as gobsmacked as I was and as the public was to 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 be in the middle of that. Um my my poor dear departed father Victor Schwartz would, was not happy that this was the thing that was going to identify me really for my for my entire career. Uh, I am forever. If you Google my name, it almost always is along with you know Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, I'm not complaining, but it, it certainly is something that I didn't imagine. I just kind of wish it was Harry Potter instead, but you know that that boat sailed too. So. Um, but, uh, I, I really don't, I don't know. I, I think that what, what happens is I, I have told the Dahmer story for 33 years and I start to forget that when you say things like, well, you know, he had a blue barrel and I mean, look how matter of factly you and I talked about that. Ah, there was a blue barrel there and there were body parts in it. And I mean, you know, most people are, what did she say? And I have to remember always that these people were real victims. They have real families that are still out there. And that that this is this is a horrifying story for people to hear about. And I always have to, I always have to remember that. Yeah, for sure. And I know we forget that sometimes. Hey, listen, I want to take a quick break. I want to know about the your feelings on the film portrayals and actually the general sense of the public's fascination with true crime, especially, you know, the grislier, the better. But first, I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsor. Officer Store, equipping protectors with passion. That's how we operate, and it's how we live. We understand that having the right gear can mean the difference between life and death. Our goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit us at officerstore.com. And we're back, and I'm speaking with Anne E. Schwartz, author of The Man Who Could Not Kill Enough and Monster, the true story of Jeffrey Dahmer murders. And and first of all, I want to say, if we Google your name, Anne E. Schwartz, a lot comes up besides Jeffrey Dahmer. You've contributed so much, so much to law enforcement, uh, not only in Wisconsin, but for Department of Justice uh, uh, contributing on boards, uh, all in the interest of law enforcement. I want to thank you for that. Oh, I write back at you, my friend. You, uh, uh, your service is appreciated as well. I'm, I'm glad that to have been somebody who was trusted by the police to tell their stories, and I continue to try to help them tell their stories because life after May of 2020 has not gotten better for the police. There is more need than ever for the police to come out and tell their stories and talk and say, here's what we know. Um, even when we have, you know, when we have officer involved shootings, I, I think I've, I figured out once that I responded to somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 police involved shootings in my career, both at the Milwaukee Police Department, at the Department of Justice, and then now as a counselor to a number of police departments, you know, who are, are looking for a way to say, how do we tell the public what happened? Back in our day, God, now we sound like we're 100. Back in our day, it was, we don't have anything to tell you yet. When we do, we'll let you know. And then you'd put out a really little news release and, and everybody would pretty much parrot whatever it was you had in that release. May 2020, George Floyd. We do not get any grace anymore. There is more demand than ever to, to tell the story. And that is that really is is a big a big part of why I talk about the Dahmer case because you were mentioning the portrayals of it in movies and television. And it was a Netflix piece. I I contributed. I always contribute to the documentaries. I'm featured in a documentary that's on Netflix right now, Conversations with a Killer, uh, the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. But I didn't participate in the in the movie in the Netflix series that Ryan Murphy did. And there's a difference there between those two things. One of those things is a documentary. It's here is what happened. Here are the facts. The other is a movie. It's a movie. And 
you can't be mad. I I was so angry when I watched it the first time because I said, there are things in here that aren't even true. They aren't even true. I mean, the, the, the Donner did not have a neighbor in his building who called the police and said, it smells in here. Hmm. And the, the Glenda Cleveland, the woman who eventually called the police when she saw uh, Connor X sent us some phone, the uh, young Hmong boy was running up the, or Laotian boy was running up the, the alley. Uh, she didn't live in his building and they, she had never even met him. They'd never even been in the same place. So there's a lot of liberties taken in that movie. It is not a, por a positive portrayal of the police. But I have spent a lot of time talking about this case, in particular, the incident where Jeffrey Dahmer in May of 1991 is confronted by police when Connor X sent us phone, the 14-year-old boy who didn't look like a 14-year-old boy. We, people forget that part. Uh, a lot, I shouldn't say people forget that part. Not a lot of people have told that part of the story. Um, but uh, it, it's unrealistic to me for people to think that someone back in the late 80s, early 90s would say, aha, serial killer. Mm. Who in the world? You know, Connor X sent us phone was to be Jeffrey Dahmer's, um, uh, I'm trying to remember that there were four people that were killed after Connor X. So uh, he was going to be, uh, be one of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims. What happens with serial killers is toward the end of their spree, they get sloppy, they get messy, uh, there were between May and, and July, uh, Dahmer killed five more people. The bodies were quite literally stacking up in his apartment, but he was getting sloppy. So he didn't, he picked up Conorak. He offered him money for sex. Conorak came back to his apartment and Dahmer, uh, gave him a, he always, he would knock people out, give them a drink that would, would knock them out. And he didn't put enough in Conorak's drink. So Connor Rack had passed out. Dahmer left to go get more beer. Dahmer also was an alcoholic. So he went out to get more beer. And in the meantime, Connor Rack wakes up. Connor Rack wakes up and runs out of the apartment. But Jeffrey Dahmer had also done something else before Connor Rack had gotten out of that apartment. He had drilled a hole in the boy's skull and was going to, what he wanted to create was sort of a, uh, a zombie kind of a, a figure. I mean, this is, we're in the mind of a really, really, uh, uh, you know, screwed up guy. This is not, you know, it's it's weird that we're even talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Conorak is is still, he's still able to, to move, runs out of the apartment. He's running up the alley. Lady in the apartment building across the alley says, I see a naked guy running up the alley. Uh, I think, you know, the police should come and check this out, which they did. Dahmer now is go off getting beer. The police show up at the scene. There's a med unit already there. Uh, Conorak is sitting on the back of the med unit, wrapped in one of those big blankets that looks like aluminum foil. He is not a great English speaker, but remember, this guy's also got a hole drilled in his head. And he's drunk and drugged. Actually, he's drugged. So he's not able to communicate with the officers. Jeffrey Dahmer walks up with his six-pack of beer and uh, sees Conorak sitting there and he's as calm as he can be. It's the problem officers. And uh, he's talking to, to two police officers that to this day wish they would have had a crystal ball and would have been able to say, gosh, this guy, he is a serial killer. But mm -hmm. here's the thing about serial killers, Jim, they look like everybody else. It's why they go so long without getting caught. And so he's talking, Dahmer's talking to the officers. He says, that's my boyfriend, Jim. He said, uh, we're, you know, we're in a relationship. He said, Jim got a little drunk and, you know, ran out of the house. I'll just take him back with me. The officer said, okay, but we, you know, we're, we're not going to stop there. We're going to, you know, and, and Conorak does not have a reaction when Dahmer shows up. Like, no, no, don't, you know, don't send me with that guy. So they go back up to Dahmer's apartment. The officers also. That's why it's important for me always to mention what it looked like when I kind of stuck my head in the apartment. It looks like a single guy's apartment, not a torture chamber. Mm. And the officers walk into the apartment with Dahmer, with Conorak. And Dahmer says, here's, you know, it, it, Conorak sits down on the couch. On the corner of the couch, Conorak's clothes are kind of folded neatly in the corner of the couch. All right. So 
Um, and then also there are Polaroids already on the on the coffee table that depict very sexualized poses of Conrad that he was doing for Dahmer while Dahmer photographed him. So the officers really did not have probable cause to say, and we'd like to see the rest of the apartment. Because mm. if they had seen the rest of the apartment, they would have found Tony Hughes's body laying on the bed in the next room. But again, what are we expecting from our officers in 1991? And I know a lot of people don't like that I defend the police in this case. I really do. Because I don't know what more they could have done than the, than what they did that night. They left. Dahmer killed Conorak immediately after they left. Um, and then went on to kill four more people. But the idea that he somehow slipped through the system, you know, I, I don't give it that cavalier a, a characterization. Mm. There are always, when we go back and we look at these cases, you know what I make sure my the, the, the law enforcement I work with do first thing whenever they catch some kind of a, a serial killer or they catch a, you know, catch a, someone for a grisly homicide. I say, go back and find every call for service you ever had at that guy's house or in that neighborhood. And let's look at any court cases, right? But that information is not accessible, was not accessible at the time to the officers on the street. Um, so that really, it, it, it's an un, to me, it's an unrealistic expectation that two street cops in 1991 Milwaukee would have said something's wrong here mm. because we're in a challenged neighborhood. We're in a challenged neighborhood where all the apartment buildings you walk into have some kind of nasty smell going on, whether it's a mix of, um, you know, in this case, it was chemical. I this Talking about things that are unpalatable. Uh, everyone put your sandwich down because uh, you know what a dead body smells like. You know when you walk in a house or you walk in a room and you know when there is someone who is deceased in that in, in that uh, home. That wasn't the smell. This was chemical because he was using so many chemicals. He's trying, remember, the, the as I said before, the bodies are literally piling up. And so Dahmer is, uh, yes, his apartment stunk. But let me take you on the grand tour of other apartments where police officers end up doing investigations. And let's see what those smell like in the hallways where people use them as walkways and alternatively as urinals, uh, where they, you know, where garbage is known to stack up. So that's the part of this story that is so highly publicized. I'm watching one of the people that, you know, is in the uh is in the Netflix series portraying a character that really did not exist, Glenda Cleveland. She existed, but not in the way that she did in the movie, win an Emmy Award. And I just kind of sit there and it's like, well, again, it's a movie. It's a movie. Yeah. And sometimes and they people make people these, don't know that. They make these conglomerate uh characters based on four or five that they just yeah. don't have time for. So they make them one person. Sure. So it's let me ask story you that way. Right, right. <laughs> Make it tight. So so let me ask you this. 30 years later, cops go to a call of a guy running down an alleyway naked, uh, escaped from this guy's house. Do you see the same uh situation played out as in 1991? Or are things different now? No. Oh, oh no. No, there were so many lessons learned from the Dahmer case. Uh, <laughs> so much, look where we are when it comes to DNA. Look where we are when it comes to profiling. I mean, we had profiling then. We had some of the best at Quantico that came to came to Milwaukee to kind of do the, you know, do the, the profiles. But remember, Jeffrey, no, he was operating in the city. It's not like the Gilgo Beach killer. We knew he was operating. We didn't know Jeffrey Dahmer was operating. Jeffrey Dahmer was so clever, Jim, that when he would go to the gay bars in Milwaukee, he would have conversations with the with the with the men there. And he would always say, hey, you know, what was it like when you came out, you know, with your family? And if the person said it was great, 
My family's wonderful. We're very close. Dahmer would not choose that person as his victim. He chose people that he thought would not be missed. And in the case of very, a lot of his victims, the 17 victims, a lot of them weren't missed by their families. I mean, that's a that's something also that's, you know, there was no fear gripping the city of Milwaukee. We did not know. We didn't know. Yeah, I mean, a dozen people up to that point. But if we get into our time machine, go back, mm -hmm. uh, we look at crime statistics now. And <laughs> I love it when the apologists always say, well, it's not as bad as the 1990s. Oh. So we're, if we're looking at 1991, we're seeing you know, the crack ep epidemic and robberies and all time mm -hmm. highs of crime. So I get what you're saying in the context of crime and and the, that police response there. What is the fascination with the public uh, just gorging on true crime podcasts? <laughs> Here we are talking about it, but true crime sure. podcasts and the sensationalized uh you know, serials, uh, different kind of serials, but but TV shows and movies about these famous or infamous murderers. Mm -hmm. Here's the the interesting thing. So uh, The Man Who Could Not Kill Enough was my first book. It's now out of print. So the only book that you can get is is Monster. The What is so interesting about it is I don't know that I got a McDonald's Happy Meal with the royalties from the first the first book. It was... Uh, it came out in 1992, in June of 1992, and, and it was okay. But I mean, one of the reasons that that I was given for reissuing this book in a you know in an updated format was the idea that um, people are fascinated now with true crime. I mean, and there was always a deal where when I would talk to when I in in the 90s when I would go somewhere and people would you know oh my god that was disgusting that was awful tell me more, right? But, uh, and it still happens. But the, the true crime fascination is something that I just, it's it's not something I really understand because I don't consume true crime as a genre outside of the book that I wrote or documentaries I participate in. I'm usually watching the documentaries just to see, you know, if I look fat or something. Uh, so the... Uh, you know, to uh, it's just not something that I'm interested in. However, look where we've come when it comes to the portrayals of a lot of these crimes. You know, look where we've come. I mean, there was a, a movie done. Actually, it was interestingly enough, it was Jeremy Renner's very first movie. He played Dahmer in a a, a, a really bad B movie um, based on the first book. Uh, and it was, uh, it was on TV and it was awful and people hated it. And, you know, all of, uh, all, of, all that goes with a, with a B movie, but we're in a different place now. We have things on cable like Dexter and he's, and he's a folk hero that guy. So I think people want to know why I think people want to know why they love I, what is the most popular genre on television right now? It's police procedurals because people want to see behind the curtain and they want to know. You know, I always loved talking to to retired guys like you, Jim, because you always say, oh, it's not that interesting or I don't have any. You don't realize how fascinating that job is. And people want to see behind that curtain. They want to see how did you catch the guy? What mistakes did the guy make? Uh, that's what, what people love. And I think true crime in some way is people saying, I'm going to figure, I'm going to make sure that nobody I know is doing anything like this, or mm -hmm. I don't want to be a victim. Right. So, but I just, I, you know, I think it is just that, that people are fascinated by these fantastical stories. And, and as you retell them for television or for movies, the next one has to be more fantastical than the next. Well, this one's hard to beat. <laughs> <laughs> that it is. That it is. And you know, the people in Milwaukee say the same thing that people all over the country who are listening to this say. That could never happen here. Oh, that could never happen here. That would never happen here. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. was the heart of the Rust Belt in 1991. This guy was, was you know, killing since 1978. His first murder was when he was, 19, was 18 years old in Ohio. Hmm. And then he moved here. 
but you know, how are we to know that somebody like this is operating in, you know, in, in our neighborhood? We're, we don't know. Yeah. I'm grateful whatever people want to talk about the case, because if it means that one more person understands, gets the truth, that I'm I'm all for that. And I also use it as an opportunity to say police officers did yeoman's work in this. They weren't searching for a serial killer. They had their serial killer. The hardest part of this case is they had to identify all of the bodies and the remains that were were in, in that, that apartment and match them up to the families. Mm. You know, there was there was no, they didn't have a whiteboard. They didn't have anything like that. What they had was a room, they called it the war room. And there was a blank wall and they had the big, these big white pieces of paper. Uh, they had 17 pieces, white pieces of paper that represented each of the 17 victims. The reason they knew there were 17 is Jeffrey Donner confessed to it. So they got Gray's Anatomy the, they got the, you know, the book, the uh, anatomical, you know, figures. They made photocopies, 17 of them. And then as they found body parts, they circled on the different, all of the different uh, uh, papers. I mean, it was, it was a, a crude way. It was early, you know, who else Forensics. did you call and say, hey, what was your serial killer investigation like? It wasn't yeah. exactly about information sharing. But where when the FBI says there are as many as 50 Serial killers operating at one time in this country. I think more and more law enforcement, more and more communities, you know, are going to find people like Rex Hoyerman or, you know, whoever they find they find next. Yeah. So 33 years ago, cub reporter Ann E. Schwartz goes out on this call of uh, a murder and tip of the iceberg. The next month, the next two months, three months through the trial, uh, that's a lot of trauma to carry with you. What's your relationships been like with law enforcement since? I know the answer because I've seen your bio and all the great work you've done since. How do you keep your head in it? How do you keep your nose in the law enforcement genre? Because my beginnings were as a journalist, and I think there's nothing more important than to tell the story. And if I can help law enforcement, which I do, uh, I'm uh, I'm with the uh, uh, law firm of uh, Cribello, uh Nichols and Hall, and I started a division for that law firm, uh, where we represent the public sector, its municipalities, police departments, sheriffs departments, firefighters, uh, anyone who is in that very public space, who has to talk about something that happened, and everyone is litigious. Right. So that's what uh, that's the way that I look at it. I look at it as a I'm, I'm kind of a, a risk manager. Uh, I'm a risk uh, rent management tool. When I come in after a police shooting, after an officer involved shooting and say, OK, what do we know? What do we know for sure? What can we say? What can we show? I mean, you look no farther than Kenosha, Wisconsin, if you want to see where they could have used somebody helping them in that way to come out and say, here's what actually happened with that shooting. You're seeing more, look what we're seeing on TV. We're seeing more and more video being re released earlier. We didn't used to see that. Well, we didn't have it, but you know, we're, we're seeing uh, law enforcement push video out there more often. I help them figure out what that'll look like. What can, what, how can we frame your message so that we're telling your story and we're mitigating the amount of misinformation that ends up flying around. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I am, I'm, I can't get away from you guys. I just, uh, I love working with law enforcement. I always have. I've worked for some amazing. Uh, I've worked some, for some amazing police chiefs, uh, and now I work with some amazing police chiefs, prosecutors. Uh, prosecutors are coming under fire more and more because people are saying, "Well, how's that? What's that guy doing out?" And sometimes the prosecutors have to. They don't like it, but they have to say, here's why this guy's out. I mean, you saw that with the Waukesha Christmas Parade case here where Daryl Brooks drove his minivan or drove his uh, his car through a Christmas parade, killing six people in Waukesha, Wisconsin, another small suburb where people said this doesn't happen here. And now we, you know, now we're seeing barriers that look like something out of, uh, you know, out of Kabul 
up in, you know, when we have a Christmas parade because people don't want anyone to drive through and, and, and ride over people. Yeah. So it, it, it law enforcement is changing. I want to help them figure out how to still do the job amid that changing atmosphere. So that is what keeps me going. Nice. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for what you do. And E. Schwartz, author of The Man Who Could Not Kill Enough and Monster, the story of the Jeffrey Dahmer murders. Thanks for taking time with us today. Jim, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, listeners, thanks for listening. And let me know what you think about today's show. Drop me a line at policing matters at police one.com. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think? What What do you do when you get a case like this or your agency does? Um, she just talked about the mood going from excitement to flat and silent. And, uh, you know, the considering the officers and then the people on the periphery and the long lasting effects that it has on them, the public loves to hear about this. Uh, I don't know that if they'd be that excited if they were actually on scene. Tell me what you think. Drop me a line. All right. Hey, take good care. Thanks for listening and hope to talk to you again real soon. Take good care. Bye.